<coughs> so Elizabeth, um, so this conference was going to be on personalized medicine and precision medicine. And so I had to ask, well, what, what, what do you mean by that? Um, these terms are used interchangeably by different people, often without a specific purpose or definition. And I'm not sure, does anyone in here actually know what these terms mean? When I ask clinicians, they, they get irritated because they think that they give individualized medicine or personalized medicine. They say, as a surgeon, for example, that's what I do every day. So they feel a bit offended by, by this. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to give you my perspective on what these two things are and how they're different and how you can move from one to the other. So that's sort of the, the overall purpose of the talk today. So the term personalized medicine was actually coined in 1999 by two Wall Street journalists. And they were reporting on the, the first of these new targeted therapies that was used in a selective patient population. And, and they extrapolated and said, you know, just imagine a world when we could screen patients for their unique genetic profile and we could match a drug to those particular patients. That's what they envisaged by personalized medicine. And this is what they imagined, is that, you know, we have these well-described pathways where there are myriads of different alterations and mutations and we have a drug covered full of therapies that we can then match to those respective therapies. This, this is what they had in mind. So my question to you is, you know, how far have we got down this road and, and how far is reasonable and practical based on what we know today? And I'm going to give you some examples. So this paradigm arose from Genentech, the company that Simon mentioned I worked for and I was in charge of pathology and diagnostics, the laboratory arm of the company's personalized medicine program. And, and this uh, paradigm began with uh, trastuzumab or the septin, which is a monoclonal antibody that was designed specifically to inhibit HER2, which was amplified and overexpressed in around about 15 to 25 percent of patients with advanced breast cancer. So it's a monoclonal antibody binding to the receptor and Assays were developed in the company to screen patients who had tumors that overexpressed HER2. And if the tumor was two or three positive by diagnostic chemistry, the patients were enrolled in the trial. And if there were zero or one plus, they were excluded and offered some other treatment. So the idea is to enrich the clinical trial for patients who, based on the biology and the results of the biomarker assay, were more likely to benefit. So there are a population of patients on the left. They're a mixed bag. We don't know a priori who's going to benefit or not. We do the test. We segregate. We enrich our patients who are going to benefit, enroll them on the clinical trial, and offer the patients who are negative something else. So this is the, the result of those very first perception trials. Now this was performed in patients who had very late stage advanced breast cancer. These were the patients in which they basically exhausted most other treatment options. And you can see the survival advantage on the right. I mean, it's very small, isn't it? But this is the first time that we start to see evidence of this effect. In early breast cancer, the size effect is much bigger, and the p-value was 10 to the minus 13. But this was the first signal. Now, in this population on the right, which is the selected population, the target prevalence, obviously, because we've defined it by the patients who are positive, is 100%. And these two trials, which this is aggregate data of, required 1,250 patients, so it took 32 months to accrue those patients. After the trials were completed, and this was statistically significant, the drug was approved, and it's now been used over a million women in the world because of this, uh, these results. But the mathematicians went back and said, well, what would have happened had we not adopted this new selective strategy? And so the answer was that the target prevalence of 25%, it would have taken 11,000 patients in nearly 30 years. Right. So essentially, a four-fold enrichment through the selection process resulted in about a tenfold increase in efficiency in drug development. So this has now become the paradigm for the development of target therapies across the whole field of oncology because of this, these first studies. And, you know, and, and David has mentioned it, it has been a, it has been a success, there's no doubt. 
there are a number of these targeted therapies, there are over 25 or 30 now, available on the market worldwide. The time to approving these drugs is shrinking. It can be anywhere now between three and eight years rather than the normal 15 years. And it has greatly increased the probability of success of these clinical trials. So there's no doubt that in the right circumstances, this has been a, a great improvement in efficiency in drug development. So, you know, how is this going to translate more broadly into practice? These are some of the things I, I want to explore here. Now, if you take a step back and look at the frequency of mutations in cancer, and this is, this is aggregate of multiple different genotypes, we see this same pattern of distribution. This can be all cancer types. It can be lung cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. We see the same overall pattern. There are usually a very small number, and I'm talking a handful, of genes which are mutated at high frequency in any given genotype. P53, KRAS are obviously ones we know very well. And then there is a very, very long tail as we go out to 20,000 genes of genes which are mutated very rarely. They have been described in one or two individuals. And then there's a group in this space here in which the frequency of these mutations either in a single tumor type or across multiple tumor types is sufficient for the pharmaceutical industry to take an interest. That the prevalence is sufficient that they could do clinical trials and get the drug approved and it would be economically viable for them. So this is, this is the group here that the drug development pharmaceutical industry are mostly interested in. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. So this is, for instance, a list of genes which are thought to be clinically relevant, some are what we call actionable, and some might even be druggable. And this is just in non-small cell lung cancer. And this is quite typical that we see different types of mutations in these genes. Thomas talks about base substitutions, short insertions, deletions, focal amplifications, and deletions and gene fusions. These can all be detected always by the same technology. You need a modular approach, different techniques, different methods to detect these different types of mutations. So an example I'm going to give you, which I think is probably the state of the art at the moment, is a test that a company in Boston called Foundation Medicine offer. And they offer a comprehensive test that covers over 300 genes in their gene panel, and it detects these different types of alterations with the sorts of negative and positive predictive values that you would want for a medical test that was going to use to make medical treatment decisions. And the issue reports like this often don't have a lot of information. They just say these are the genes which are mutated. And they often give you um, information about potential drugs, drug targets, and maybe clinical trials. So this is a, a lot of detail here, I know. But what I'm showing you here are those profiles for lung cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer on several hundred patients. And what they've done here is they've identified the genes and the frequency at which they're mutated and the different types of mutations are color-coded. And then you'll see the, the line above it with the diagonal writing. These represent therapies which could potentially match those particular molecular alterations in those different genotypes. So what they're claiming is that if we do these tests, if we screen these patients for these common mutations, there is a possibility that the patient could be um, treated with one of these therapies. And they claim that the, the actionable rate is there's usually two mutations per tumor, and about 85% of patients, you will find one or more actionable mutations. So it sort of makes a compelling case that we should be screening patients because we could be finding these type of therapies. And yet, who are the patients we should be testing? Do we test all patients? Do we test all patients with metastatic disease? Or do we test them, say, later on in the disease when they have exhausted all standard care treatment options and are really left with no other option? Because most of these therapies are unproven therapies in that particular indication. Right? So, so I believe that this has a place, but it should be restricted to patients who have advanced disease, have exhausted all other treatment options. And then the question is, well, are the drugs available? Most of these are experimental, they're not yet approved. 
in many cases, not approved for that particular indication. And so these patients have to go on clinical trials. Now, are those clinical trials available in our community? In many cases, they're not. This gets to your question, Sam. So, you know, often we only have in any one institution, even at the Peter McKellen, you know, a dozen or so clinical trials of this type going on at any one time. In Boston, for instance, if you were uh, uh, there, you might have a hundred trials to choose from. So in that circumstance, it makes more sense because there is a reasonable probability that you get a patient on trial, but in communities like ours, that is less likely. So as I said, these are sort of overview statistics of 13,000 patients. They will find molecular alterations which are clinically meaningful in most of the patient samples. Usually two clinically relevant alterations per patient with a range of zero and some, up to 28. Um, but how many of these actually make a difference? How many patients are actually put on clinical trials and may have a survival advantage? Right now, I don't think we have a clear answer for that. The diagnostic yield is certainly a lot lower from what they're claiming, and, and actual improvements have yet to be demonstrated, I think, conclusively. So I still regard this as being very experimental, as David said, very much still in the research space. Now what we are doing in Melbourne, in my laboratory, and this is in collaboration with my colleagues at the Peter McCallum, is evaluating, again in a research setting, the clinical utility, the diagnostic yield from whole exome sequencing of tumor samples. So the panel that we're using here has 4,800 genes, and rather than analyze the entire 4,800 genes, we develop virtual panels, and so we have one panel for inherited mutations, which is this panel here, so we narrow our interrogation to that particular group of genes and say, can we find evidence in the tumor and the matched blood sample of an inherited germline mutation? So this is one such patient, and David, you'll be thrilled, this is a patient with an angiosarcoma. I'm standing. Um, this patient had a completely unsuspected, potentially deleterious BRAC2 mutation. <coughs> Thus far, 50% of the patients we have identified have found a germline mutation which might be pathogenic or is, is possibly pathogenic. So that's a much higher yield in terms of unsuspected germline mutations than we, than we had in this age. But I might just mention, you can see here the total number of variants that we identified from these patients was nine, it's about 9,000 per patient. It takes about a week to go through and analyze all of this data. So this is, this is very labor intensive. You know, by no means do we have either the bioinformatic tools or the annotated data sets to be able to analyze this data in a time and a cost-effective manner at this point in time. When it comes to somatic variants, we again focus on mutations which have been reported through the Cancer Genome Project that occurred frequently in that particular histological type. And so in this case, this particular tumor is a rare brain tumor called a pleomorphic ambassador sotoma. That's the gene list that we developed for that particular case, interrogated that. We found a PRAF V600E mutation on this, in this patient. There's a single case report of a patient with this mutation, which is the same one that occurs in melanoma, that has responded to the drug thermographic. <coughs> so this patient is going on a clinical trial. So you know, in this case, we may have done this patient some good. And there's the mutation there. Now, interestingly, it was missed when we first filtered the data. And I said, just go back and have a look and see if you can find this mutation, because I was aware that it was prevalent. The filters that we used bioinformatically actually filtered it out. Right? So again, we don't quite have the tools refined enough yet for clinical use. But this study is to try and develop the know-how how to do that. But by no means is this ready yet for clinical practice. So in this circumstance, like the patient with the xanthastrocytoma and the BRAP mutation, we're really conducting this case in you know, N of one clinical trials because these are going to be rare, single events, probably unpredictable. You don't, can't necessarily assume that because we found this mutation in this type that it will benefit as it does in melanoma, for instance. We know that's certainly the case in colorectal. So each of these tumors is going to have a whole different set of wires. It'll be wired differently, and it may not respond the same way. So in many ways, 
when, we, when, we, when we're taking this approach, we're really playing chess with cancer. You know? As David said, you know, he's using his intuition and we're making best guesses. Now, I think, although there's a danger to that, I think in the right clinical context, and that is patients with advanced disease who have exhausted all other therapeutic options, I still believe that their best bet is to go with the biology that we're identifying through this method. And we're making our best guesses, but they are best guesses. There's certainly no guarantees. So it's at this end of the, the curve, that the long, long tail, that I think is really personalized medicine. We're identifying things which are rare, which are often individual, and we're trying to match the patient to a therapy, and we may or may not. The therapy may or may not be available, and it may or may not work. Right? So that's what I think is what I'm, I'm going to call personalized medicine. Now we can use that information if we see a response in one of these patients. They're a bit like the canary in the coal mine. And if we see a signal, then we can say, well, let's see if we can work with our colleagues around the world and with the companies and do a clinical trial of maybe 10, 20, 30 patients to see if we see the same response. Now, there are examples of this approach being used and has worked. In fact, one of the very first of these studies was performed here, uh, led by Melbourne, in, in Melbourne. Uh, not here, but in Australia. Um, so th this, this approach, I think, can be beneficial for people beyond the patients that we're testing, because we can identify these therapeutic signals that might be otherwise um, completely missed. So I'm going to refer to this stage here, when we're looking at mutations which are more prevalent, either because within the community they are more prevalent, or because we enrich for them from this personalized medicine approach. But here, we can start making multiple measurements. We can have 20 or 30 patients on a signal-seeking study. With multiple measurements, we can start measuring things like accuracy and precision. Right? And so this is where I think the term precision is better used. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we're applying that uh, in my laboratory with my collaborators. So the first example I'm going to give you, and Jenny will appreciate this, are these two drugs called cetuximab and panitumumab. <clears throat> these are monoclonal antibodies like the septin, and they bind to the EGFR receptor, which is part of the herd two family. These drugs are both approved in patients who have, have advanced colorectal cancer. And it's a $2 billion industry. A course of these two drugs costs $30,000 per patient for an eight-week course. Now, we now know that if downstream there is a mutation in either KRAS or BRAF, these patients do not benefit. And now these tests are routinely used to screen patients. So it's only the patients who are RAF wild type that are now eligible for either of these two drugs. Right. But even so, in that patient population, only about 10 to 15 percent of those patients, this gets to your point, Jenny, actually have a major therapeutic benefit. We know from the monotherapy trials that the response rate is, um, is, is, is only significant in about that 10 to 15 percent of the population. So there's a lot of patients here who are being treated by these expensive therapies. They have often serious side effects, rashes and so forth, that we've discussed before. And most of these patients aren't going to derive any benefit from this treatment. So, you know, who are these patients? Can we try and tease these survival curves apart? Because hidden in the blue line here are some patients who are getting extraordinary benefit, and the majority of patients are getting no or very little benefit. So they're diluting out the real effect of these drugs if we could target the right patient population. Now, it's interesting that once a company has developed a drug and got it on market, they very rapidly lose interest in understanding you know, who are the patients that benefit. So the hypothesis we're testing is that this is a ligand-dependent mechanism, nothing to do with mutations. The antibodies bind to the ligand-binding domain of EGFR, and they block the ligands. So, so it has to be involving the ligands in some capacity. There are seven different ligands 
that bind to this particular family of receptors. And two of them, A-ray and E-ray, which you can see listed there, are known <clears throat> to be significant in terms of predicting benefit from these patients. So what we have done is formed a collaboration with a company. This is Roche Diagnostics, the largest diagnostic company in the world. And we have developed antibodies against these two ligands, epiregulin and amphiregulin. And these are three colorectal cancer cases here that are selected. And the first thing that's surprising <clears throat> is that there's often frequent discordance. So, you know, you would have expected if this is a drug that's been approved in colon cancer, that the ligands that the drug is inhibiting would be expressed in most cases as along with the receptor. But in fact, what we often find is the discordance that there can be no ligand expression and, and expression of the receptor or expression of the ligands, which is incredibly heterogeneous, and no or heterogeneous expression of the receptor. So <clears throat> hidden in here somewhere is a pattern, and I presume it's going to be expression of either ligand and its receptor, right, that defines the patient population that likely benefits. Now our preliminary information indicates that that combination is present in about 10 to 15 percent of all patients with stage 4 colorectal cancer. So maybe this is the mechanism that underpins the action mechanism of this particular drug. Now if that's the case, we could narrow down the patient population and, and just treat these patients and exclude the patients who are, who are negative, as shown here. So what we're doing here, through this practice of precision medicine, we're trying to identify based on the biology, all those patients that we believe are likely to benefit and exclude all those that are not. We're close to analyzing, uh, to, to validating this assay and establishing the cut point, and we have access to five clinical trials from around the world, over 2,000 patients, to validate this finding clinically in first, second, and third line. So within a year or two, we hope to have a definitive answer. Now, the companies aren't going to like this article because it's going to shrink their minds. But the upside is that if this ligand-dependent mechanism is prevalent, it may also be operating in breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, other tumor types. And therefore, we go back and analyze their failed clinical trials in those indications and try and identify a responder subset. And then open up new markets in other indications. Right? Because this is not likely to be a mechanism that's just unique to colon cancer. So can you see the advantage of this precision approach? <coughs> Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. You probably noticed and losing my voice. <coughs> the next example I'm going to tell you about is, is ovarian cancer. We have a major program in ovarian cancer genetics in Melbourne. This particular subtype, the high-grade serous ovarian cancer, is the commonest type and the one that accounts for most of the mortality. This paper is about to be published in Nature from David Vitell's group of the Cal. And what this clearly shows here is that there are a number of patients with this tumor that have mutations in BRCA1 or 2, or germline mutation, or, or, or um, sorry, uh, promoter hypermethylation, some have somatic mutations. And there's another group over here that have amplification or overexpression of cyclin E. So that can be summarized in this slide here. So if you look at all of the different molecular subtypes of this subtype, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, half of the patients, 51% here, have mutations or alterations in a pathway that's involved in homologous recombination DNA repair. And there's another group here, about 19% of the patients that have cyclic E amplification. So I'm just going to focus on those two groups for a moment. So this is the pathway of modus recombination. There's about a dozen genes that encode proteins that form these multi-protein complexes around double-strand DNA repair and involved in the DNA repair mechanism. And inactivating mutation in any one of those disables the homologous recombination pathway and the, the tumors become HR deficient. Now this is clinical data from a clinical trial of a PARP inhibitor called Alaparib. This was run by AstraZeneca, and the study was done in patients with high-grade um, serious ovarian cancer after they had 
being treated with platinum therapy and had shown they were responsive. So this is a maintenance therapy. <clears throat> and initially, it was done in all comers, and that's the survival advantage. It's statistically significant for progression-free survival, but not overall survival. So on the basis of that, the drug has been approved. They went back and analyzed the samples from the patients and showed an even greater therapeutic benefit in patients who were known to have germline mutations in BRCA1 and 2 based on their family history and genetic testing. <clears throat> right? So enriching for patients who are going to benefit and they get a better overall survival advantage. What was interesting is in this group, which are the patients who have this high-grade serous tumor, platinum sensitive, so they're enriched for HR deficient tumors. There's still a survival advantage here with this drug in patients who do not have a germline mutation of BRCA1 or 2. So there are other patients in here who benefit. Presumably, this is the group that have other mutations in the HR pathway. Somatic mutations in BRCA1, BRCA1 methylation, or mutations in other genes. Right? So the question is, you know, who are these patients? Can we find who they are? So we have developed a next generation sequencing panel. This captures those genes in the HR pathway that I mentioned. This looks for small insertions and deletions and point mutations. We've developed an MLPA assay to look for large deletions and duplications of whole exons or whole, uh, whole, whole genes. And that works beautifully in paraffin sections. And then we have an assay for BRCA1 methylation. So with this assay, we can capture <clears throat> all the patients in that 51% and not just the 16% who have germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations. So this panel potentially allows us to double, possibly triple, the number of patients who like to benefit from this therapy. And we've got <clears throat> approval from AstraZeneca to conduct a clinical trial, a phase 2 signal-seeking clinical trial in patients who have either germline <clears throat> mutations in the HR genes, somatic mutations in the HR genes, or methylation of these two genes. So we're trying to separate these curves by making the blue curve even higher. <clears throat> but interestingly, <clears throat> as you saw from the uh, survival figures, there was no improvement in overall survival. And the likely reason for that is nearly all these patients, when treated with platinum chemotherapy or a PARP inhibitor, eventually become resistant. And the resistant mechanism is due to revertent mutants. Secondary mutations, which restore the wild-type function of the gene and make the tumor HR proficient again, and therefore are inhibitor insensitive. This is from an autopsy study here that showed <clears throat> in a single patient at death 14 different revertent mutants in different tumors throughout the body. So this pervasive mechanism. So <clears throat> we are focusing on patients who will treat these patients as early as we can in their disease. As soon as they finish their first round of platinum chemotherapy, they start this clinical trial. Because we're trying to capture them in this window of opportunity before the curves converge because of the acquisition of those resistant mutations. Right? So we're trying to truncate this ellipse at this point here and try and maximize the benefits in that particular space. So we're, we're excluding patients who have these recurrent mutants, both because we're looking at first line, and secondly, by excluding them because of the assay, where we can detect these recurrent mutants. <clears throat> so we're going to be screening about 600 patients to enroll 40 patients on this clinical study. So we're going to screen a lot of patients for this. So while we've got the tissues and while we're screening them, why not screen up for other things that they could potentially benefit from? So the panels were designed to detect a whole range of different alterations, sorry, a whole range of different alterations and potentially allocate them to different treatment arms. It's called the allocate study accordingly. And so and we have another trial here for the group that has the cyclic E amplification, which I mentioned here is about 90%, has a poor prognosis. And we can use a CDK2 inhibitor in this group to block the effects of cyclin E. And so we're offering the patients who we're testing other treatment options. <clears throat> in this case, this will be for patients who have platinum resistant 
um, ovarian cancer because they don't respond to plasma chemotherapy. So we've probably got two other trials lined up, but ideally we would like to be able to offer something to everybody who we test. That will be the ultimate game uh, changer here. So <clears throat> what, I, what I've been trying to show you here is that through this iterative process of screening patients, either based on the, <clears throat> the clinical situation, so first line, or the histology, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, or on the genotype, whether it's uh, HR deficient tumor due to multiple causes, each of those steps is an enrichment strategy. What we're trying to do is identify all the patients based on the biology who are likely to benefit and exclude all those patients who are not and offer them something else, hopefully that's matched to a therapy. So essentially what we're doing through this process of precision medicine, we're narrowing down, we're trying to lift this rock curve here up into this top left-hand corner. We're trying to get it as close to 100% specificity and 100% sensitivity. Identify all the patients who benefit and exploring, excluding all those, those that don't. Right? It's all about specificity and sensitivity. And so if we use this approach, hopefully we can do clinical trials like the one I mentioned, <clears throat> prove that it works, get the company to do a randomized study, get approval, and then that then can be used in clinical practice. And so we can reduce this precision medicine back down to personalized medicine. So you can see the two different types precision and personalized medicine, and how you can move from one to the other, depending on circumstances. So I'll just end here by saying if we're going to develop these targeted therapies, we have to do it two different ways. One is by matching the right patients to the right drugs, right, which is the precision medicine approach, and the other is to match the right drugs to the right patients, which is the personalized medicine.